This is More Than Money with Mapalo Marku, brought to you by Sasfin Wealth. Welcome to More Than Money. I'm Mapalo Marku, a personal finance columnist, and I love having money conversations that change people's perspective about finances. Why am I doing this podcast, you might ask? To talk about money, not the paper stuff. I mean the baggage, the feeling, the emotional, heart-wrenching stuff. We find this conversation so uncomfortable to have, which is why on this podcast, I have decided to have this very difficult conversations. We are going to scratch. We are going to have some difficult discussions because better money conversations lead to better money confidence and healthy money dialogue leads to healthy money decisions. Today, I have the honor of speaking to an award-winning author and extreme adventurer. And when I say extreme, that is not an understatement. Neil Peterson, thank you so much for joining us today. Wonderful to be on your show. Would you just describe to us why in the world would you decide to go alone at sea? And what brought you to become such an adventurer? Well, I am African. And in Africa, we know about adventure, we know about challenge, and we're not afraid. I love the sea, I love sailing, and a lot of people say to me, you can't do this, it's impossible. Well, I don't understand the word impossible. I only understand what can I accomplish. When somebody says to me, you can't do something, I look at it from the perspective of saying, no, you don't think you can, doesn't mean that I can't. And so for me, it's always about looking and saying, what can I I do. Do I have the confidence? Do I have the courage? Do I have the ability to tackle something that I believe in? What is my dream? Am I willing to make the sacrifices to realize that dream? And so because I really love the sea and I love sailing, I could go and spend a lot of time crewing on other people's yachts. And somebody can say, oh, you're on somebody's good boat. Or, oh, you are with a great crew. Therefore, it is their success that you are riding upon. But for me, it was having my own boat, because that was part of that dream, to own a yacht, and then to sail that boat on my merits, and then to race that boat solo, where nobody could say, oh, you got lucky, or oh, it is somebody else's success. This was the ultimate ability to prove to myself that I can be as good as anybody else, that I can take on any challenge and succeed at that challenge, because I made the commitment of the hard work. I took the dream, and I took the risks. And how the chips fell is how I deal with the circumstances. And the sea is unforgiving. And I grew up on the Cape Town coast. We don't call the Cape of Good Hope just because, oh, we get lucky. We also call it the Cape of Storms because you've got to be incredibly good. For centuries, seafarers have come from Europe, have come from Asia around our Cape. And not everybody made it. It is a brutal coast. I've seen big fancy yachts come adrift, come come ashore on the Cape of Good Hope, the storms. And so to grow up on that coast and to realize that I can be as good as any sailor in the world or better because I survived the Cape of Storms, that was a big motivation for me. So now in one of your interviews, I read that they had called your boat the floating coffin. Can you give us a little bit of a background why you decided to build your own yacht. Where did that tenacity come from? And maybe you can take us through your childhood. So that headline was the front page of the Cape Times. Somewhere around 1990, I was looking for sponsorship. And I built this boat because nobody was going to give me a boat. And so I found a gentleman in Marcel Bay to help me. He designed the hull. And a team helped build a hull in the deck. And then I ended up finding somebody else to help build a keel and somebody else to help me build a rudder and somebody else to help build a mass. And we put all of these things together. And in this process, I was trying to find money. And I was talking to all the South African corporations of, I wanted to do this race called the O-Star. It's a solo race from Plymouth, England to Newport, Rhode Island. And three South Africans had done it before. The first was Bruce Dalling in the original Ford Trekker. Then came Bertie Reed, also in that original Fort Trekker. And then came John Martin in Fort Trekker 2. And they all did remarkably well. But they were naval officers. They had the money, the support 
of the government behind them, and this was during the apartheid years, and the color of my skin did not fit their model. Mm. And nobody was going to give me the national yacht. I wasn't a member of the Navy. I was a member of a yacht club. But the yacht club was also not very really thrilled about this advancement that I was trying to bring into, into the world of sailing, of being an equal. And because I couldn't get the money, I wasn't going to allow that to detract me. So I built a career as a commercial diver. So I worked mining diamonds back in South Africa. I worked the world rigs in the Gulf of Mexico and North Sea and various overseas locations to earn the money, save and invest that money so that I could put it towards this dream. When I was appealing for sponsorship, and I was making the argument to the media, the journalists doing their job, being fair and balanced, interviewed the selling community. And some of them were yeah. detractors. And the head of Kaza and somebody from uh, one of the sales uh, units uh, selling equipment went on record saying that my boat was unsafe, that I lacked all the equipment. Yes, I lacked the equipment because I lacked the money, but my boat was not yeah. unsafe. Because as of the process of trying to put the resources to get it up to the standard that the ocean would require. But I was judged. And hence, there were people who looked at me and said, in the condition that boat is in, it's going to break. And he's going to need rescue. Then it's going to be an embarrassment to the yachting establishment in the country. He doesn't fit in here with where he is, with what he has. And that's how they came about calling my boat the floating coffin. And when... That front page story came out. No corporation wanted to support me because they believed that I was unsafe. But nobody looked inside at the internals of who is the sailor? What is the capabilities of the individual? Was I suicidal? Was I crazy? Or was I a calculating risk taker? They could not see that spirit of the calculating risk taker. Sure. I knew that my boat would stand up to the conditions. Because I'm not about to kill myself. I know what the sea can do. I may not have had the electronics. I may not have had the fancy sails. But what I had was safety, experience. I had skills. I knew how to fix things. I built this boat. I knew where the weaknesses were. This is what they did not see. But that article was devastating to my ability to raise the, the capital. And so I chose to leave. Mm. And to sail away with what I had, find another way. And this comes back now to my background. I was born with a physical disability. I couldn't walk as a child because I only have one hip socket. So I missed a lot of my schooling because I went through three major surgeries prior to the age of six. But I also come from a mother who was very, very strong. And a woman who said, if you can overcome your disability, if you can overcome the prejudice of apartheid of South Africa, and if you can find a way to work within your means financially to what you've got, you will be a strong individual. If you learn not to carry chips on your shoulder, if you learn mm. to be tolerant of criticism, but not necessarily be defeated by criticism, you can rise above the noise. Even some of my own family criticized me. Some of my own family didn't believe that I could do this. My uncles basically said, who do you think you are? They didn't believe in my ability to dream because they saw the big pictures of the fancy boats. They didn't see that spirit. And they, again, so many people doubted me. And my father, he taught me my love of the sea. And one of the things my father said to me, never turn your back to the ocean. It will surprise you. Always yeah. confront the ocean. Always face the ocean so you know what's coming at you. Sadly, my father was an alcoholic. And he was a man who lost his dreams, partly because of apartheid, but also partly he lost his spirit. But somehow he managed to instill in me that spirit of the sea, that spirit of adventure, a spirit to dream. I wanted to take that combination of what my mother taught me about the value of knowledge, the value of education, and that spirit my father gave me. That combination really became the catalyst that gave me the ability to succeed at anything I have chosen, whether it was racing a boat or you know, writing several books and facing publishing houses, declining my, my, my books, and the rejections that come with that, but still the tenacity to keep going forward or building another company and investors say, oh, you can't do this. It doesn't work. But constantly finding a way of how do you board your team? Mm -hmm. Those were the elements of my heritage. And my, my grandmother was from Lesotho and I saw the simplicity of her life at the richness. I remember walking somewhere near Mafateng to visit her and I was struggling to walk. And I heard the singing of the women in the fields and this beauty of these voices coming up in the fields. And I looked 
at the mountains surrounding that area and the, the power of those mountains. Now look at the power of the mountains, Cape Town, Table Mountain. I mean, these are the roots of my Africa that I cannot ever forget. That gives me the strength mm. to go anywhere in the world, but know who I am, know where I've come from, know what I've overcome, what, what I've had to achieve to be what I am today. After hearing someone say such a terrible thing about something that you are trying to build, how do you get over that disappointment from people saying, you know, we don't think you're going to make it? If any one of us has an element of self-doubt, we always wonder, are we going to be good enough? Are we going to be strong enough? Are we going to be smart enough? And if we don't have that self-doubt, we can have some tremendous arrogance. So you can't be arrogant. You can't be a narcissist. You've got to look at that self-doubt and say, have I done everything to prepare myself? And then you can look around and say, yes, there are people who are doubting you, but what is the merit? Is their doubt in you well-founded because of something you are not seeing? You know, that brings an element of fear. I look at fear as actually as a really close personal friend because that fear tells me, pay attention to the details. For example, I see these dark clouds forming on the horizon. I start to sense the wind is picking up. The scene is changing. That fear is telling me, if I don't pay attention, where are those clouds going? How strong is that wind going to become? How strong is that sea going to be? I cannot go up against the hurricane. There is no way we're going to survive a Category 5 hurricane. I can be arrogant and say, ah, gee, sort of like, I'm super strong. I can do anything. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature doesn't care. It's going to break us. But when I see those storm clouds, I get scared. I've got to start repositioning my boat. If I protect my boat, I protect myself. Mm -hmm. So I shorten my sails. I change my course. I understand where are the dangers. The fear makes me aware of the dangers so that I can take the precautions. So when people are doubting me, I look at them in the same way and say, is this something that I am missing so that I can be better prepared? So I use that fear. I harness it to reposition. But when that fear is unfounded, then I look back and say, okay, they don't understand all the elements because they are not walking in my shoes. They are not seeing what I am seeing. They are looking at it from the outside. Now, what else do I have to do? How do I lose this position to actually slingshot myself? How do I rise above all of these things? So you start focusing on the detractors and you start focusing back on your abilities. Mm. And you build success upon success. And so I look back to my first sale. I got seasick. I was a little bit scared. I was a little bit intimidated. I overcame that because of the passion. Then I sort of said, hey, how do I become a better sailor? How do I get onto a better boat? I built experience. I became a part of a team that I could learn from. I was the weakest link in that team in the early days. Mm. What I had was enthusiasm to learn, curiosity to be better. And so what could I learn from others? What could they teach me? Until I came to that point of where I had enough knowledge to know what's dangerous and what's not dangerous, to know what is progress to versus what is regressive. And so those successes, based on experience, not based on a wish or a hope, but on mm. solid experience. So when I created that boat, I knew what the minimum standards were, what can go wrong, what can break. I also knew what I had to know as a sailor, not just in my boat. So I learned to trust my boat. I learned to trust my instincts. I learned to trust my skills. And when things go wrong, and in life things are going to go wrong, I got injured at sea. 800 miles, I had a sail with an injury. In my first round the world race, I capsized in the southern ocean off the Cape Town, broke the mast, sure. ended up in Port Elizabeth. I got hit by a Russian freighter in the North Atlantic in my third transatlantic race. I got hit in fog by a ship and I spent 15 days pumping to keep the boat afloat. Yeah, the real race started that moment. The race to get to land before the boat sank, before my energy ran out. So you learn to become innovative. Let's bring it back to your childhood. You say that you grew up in a household where you didn't have lots of money. How do you think that shaped you as a young man? So I, I came from a world of extremes. My grandmother had no money. She lived at a council house on the Cape Flats. My aunt, my cousins, they all 
stand into this little one bedroom council house. And so I saw the poverty up close. My father was always broke. He couldn't hold down a job because of his drinking. And so, oh, there's no petrol to take you diving. There's no petrol to go and do this or to go and do that. So I always grew up knowing how hard resources were. But my mother always said, you know, find a way, dream big. We don't give our women of Africa credit for the immense strength that is there. For both my grandmothers, I saw a strong sense of pride. Now, I never knew about grandfathers because they died before I was born. But I was always surrounded by really strong women. And my mother, she got a master's degree from the University of Syracuse in 1948 in the United States. Very few women in the U.S. went to university. Yet a woman came from Africa. She was the first woman of color in South Africa to be awarded a foreign scholarship to the United States to study. So the value of education was central in my house, was central to my mother. And that strength of it doesn't matter where you come from, what are you going to do? Not making excuses, finding a way. Sure. That was the engine that really made my life and my dreams successful, made it possible because there was somebody who believed in me. There was somebody who would not allow excuses. There was somebody who helped me learn accountability. So even though in my household, we did not have money, we lived within our means. Mm. And if I wanted something, it wasn't, oh, just go and take put on a credit card. We didn't have a credit card. Okay, what are you going to do to earn it? For example, when I decided I wanted to become a sailor, there were two challenges I had to overcome. One, the train fare to get to the yacht club. And second, the yacht club membership dues. I ended up recycling newspapers to get the train fare. Mm. And then when I got to the yacht club, very quickly my father had taught me to snorkel. And the wealthy sailors, they dropped things overboard. They were careless. I could dive down in a swimsuit. I could recover and charge them a few rand for that. And then on race morning, everybody likes a clean hull because a clean hull means the boat goes faster. So I would take the first train, get into that cold water at daybreak, scrub that hull clean, charge some money. And that's how I learned to save, to invest, pay for my yacht club dues. And eventually I could buy a wetsuit and then I could take scuba lessons and then I could buy my own scuba tank. This taught tenacity, this built courage, this again also said, what's important? I love a sports car. I didn't just go out and finance a sports car. I saved the money. My wife and I built a business and the reward from the success of the business, I could buy myself a sports car. I enjoy flying from time to time. I used to enjoy flying in a private jet. Again, so if I use it as a business tool to be able to do certain things, not as a luxury, but as a necessity to get a deal done. But then I think about what's the consequence? What's the carbon footprint? What is my impact on the environment? Is this the right thing yes. to do? So I choose not to own a private jet. I choose not to use it unless it's an absolute emergency. And in our country today, if we want to talk about having free education, good health care, freedom, then we have to look and understand what are our responsibilities in order to have a good education, we have to listen to our teachers. We have to show up at school. We have to pay attention, the cooperative. We have to take the exams. We have to study. You are listening to More Than Money, a podcast collaboration brought to you by Sasfin Wealth. At Sasfin Wealth, we empower our clients to reach their global investment goals, to retire with dignity, and to leave a lasting legacy. If you would like to have real money conversations, visit sasfin.com forward slash wealth and talk to us. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. What would you say to someone sitting at home, disheartened, is looking at all that is happening around them and they just don't know how to get out of it and there's a sense of hopelessness? The challenges that happen in South Africa are happening in many countries, including the United States. It is not a unique problem. So we have to look, where have we come from? Look at the challenges our country has experienced. We were once a country heavily suppressed by colonial interest. Our people were put down by colonial interest because of the color of our skin. 
we were not given an education because people did not believe that we were worthy of being educated. And look where we are today. We have broken the yoke of colonial empires, but we have also missed opportunities. I grew up during the apartheid era where I was taught at my high school. I attended Livingston High School. It was a very progressive school. And our teachers, many of them had been banned in, on Robben Island or sort of uh, some of our teachers were even killed during their the struggle for the freedom of our country. So there was a rallying call around the importance of education. Now, back in the early 1980s, there was a movement in the country that said liberation before education. You can't have liberation without education. Knowledge is the most powerful tool. If we have knowledge, then we have a chance at making a difference. And so what we have to do is we've got to develop an attitude. And that attitude has got to be, firstly, let me become a lifelong learner. I may be struggling, but what can I learn in my struggle? What skill can I, can I assume today? Who can I learn something from? So it's easy to sit there and blame a system. It's easy to sit there and feel sorry for yourself. And it's easy to sit on social media, holding a telephone in your hand and swiping left, swiping right on am I like or am I not like, and comparing yourself to something that is incompatible. It is, I can sit there and look at those big fancy yachts and feel inferior because I don't have a mega yacht, or I don't have this, or I don't have that. Or I can hold that phone in my hand and say, look at this powerful tool. How can I use this tool to learn something? How can I find a way to empower myself? What piece of knowledge do I need to get right now to be able to achieve something? So that person is broke. That person doesn't have any money. How do you get to that place of, how do you get that first rand in your pocket? Some people can go and sell drugs. Some people can go and steal it. How about that hard, honest work of saying, can I cut somebody's grass and charge them a fair price for that? Can I pick up the trash and recycle that and obtain a fair price? It's back down to what can I do to start to change my life? We start to take that ownership. And now that one rand, we have a choice. Do I go and spend it on a beer? Do I go and spend it on a cigarette? Or do I reinvest that in a tool that could help me become more effective? Look back at our African women. Look at how little so many of our African women have had and how much they've been able to do. How they've been able to put some food on the table, put some shoes on the kids' feet. Now, one of the things that also played a very big role in my world were public libraries. Because it was in a public library that I found books about the sea, about my passion, and books about investing, business, about life, adventure, everything that I could imagine, how to build my book. Today, with technology, there is so much information out here. Technology is connecting us. So if we can come back to the fundamental basics of what is my circumstance? What is my dream? Who can help me? What can I learn? And what action can I take? What is my responsibility in taking that action? Then we get to start to break the yoke of poverty. We just start saying, oh, I'm helpless. Oh, I can't do something. Oh, the world is against me. You know what? You're right. It'll all be against you. This ability to say, there's a bigger picture. If I overcome this challenge, then I can overcome that challenge. And now I can have a bigger goal, a bigger dream. Looking back at your career, what are some of the best decisions you've made so far when it comes to money? I always live within my means. I never spend something I don't have. And having understood, my, my father said he was broke. Why was he broke? He was broke because he was drinking and he was smoking. He was broke because he was gambling. It was personal decisions that he made. So I've made that decision that I'm not going to abuse alcohol. I'm not going to be a smoker. I'm going to be a risk taker, but I'm not going to be a gambler. Calculated risk. And then I take that element of hard work. If I'm going to earn a rand, I want that rand also to work for me. So how am I investing that rand? Am I investing that money in my knowledge base? And can I make myself more productive? Who do I choose to surround myself with? Are they people who are going to share my values? 
And to me, this is very important. And so when I met Darlene and my wife, we spoke about what are your goals? Where do you see yourself? And what are the things that are most important? We wanted to have a home. We wanted to be debt free. We wanted to have financial freedom. We then started to make financial decisions. Let's make sure we've got no debt. Pay yourself first and live within those means. And then save for a rainy day because there's going to be surprises. It's going to be the unforeseen. And if you want something, don't just go and buy it. Think about what is the value that this is bringing. And so it's knowing the difference between what is a need versus what is a want. It sounds like you've made all the right decisions, but we know we are human. Is there a decision that you have not been so proud of when it comes to your finances? Yes, I have made some investment decisions with people who let me down and lost mm. millions and millions of rand because I invested in people who didn't share the same ethics. They were looking for a quick way of making money and I didn't see the lack of that ethics. And I had to make a decision. When they lost my investor and my money, I had to choose whether to double down and continue to invest in them or take the loss. And if somebody no longer gives me the confidence that they can do what they said they're going to do and the lack of accountability, I'm going to fire that person and I'm going to take the hit. And so I've taken the financial hits. I've invested in industries. I've invested in companies that I made mistakes with. But I've also been very successful in investing in people who have done the right thing. But the most important thing is you've got to learn to invest in yourselves. And my advice to a lot of young people, people think, well, let me go and buy some shares in somebody's company. How about first build your own company? Don't rely on somebody else to make your money for you. You can't control that, but you can control how you spend your time. And we have to really start to ask ourselves about what I call the triple bottom line. Is this right for me? Is this right for our family and our community, the people? What is our investment in our people? And then a third component is what is the impact on our environment? Is this causing damage to the only home we've got? Mother Earth, that we in South Africa are dealing with the load shedding because our infrastructure is broken. But we can solve these problems if we trust our science, if we educate our people, if we bring ourselves up to another level of saying, hey, how do we address this? How do we address this from a climate perspective? How do we address this from an ethical perspective? How do we address this from a human perspective? Not just a profit perspective. I absolutely love what you said, Neil, that people matter. Looking at where you are now, all the things that you've learned, do you still have some fears about money? Yes, we all can have some fears about money. We can make a mistake and lose what we've got. We can end up with a unforeseen expense. Let's, for example, let's look at the cost of healthcare. We got badly ill. You can spend the last penny trying to solve a health crisis. I cannot buy another hour in my day. So what is important? Is it important to make money or is it important to have the quality of life that gives me health? And that question is, how much is enough? How do you define what is success? It is, we can't compare ourselves to others. We have to look at our own circumstances and really ask what's important. And whilst we can go out there and always focus on making more money, is it going to bring us happiness? I've met people with billions of dollars who are incredibly poor. I would not spend my time with some of them. And I've been around people who may have been on a park bench because of bad circumstances, but still had generosity of spirit than somebody with a big yacht and a helicopter. You know, having spoken to you, for me, it stands out that family, character, having the right people around you is very important. But what would you say you want your legacy to be? Legacies can produce legacies. I look at the, the legacy of my mother. She was an educator. My mother had such an impact on so many people, including me. And so when I look at what is going to be my legacy, it's not going to be how much money do we leave behind or what positions we have. It is who did we love? Who did we encourage? Who did we teach? Who did we lift up? Who did we push when they didn't believe in themselves, they could go to another level. 
It's the simple things in, in life that really, really are the true uh, values. Thank you so much, Neil. I really, really appreciate your time. That was wonderful. So many lessons and we cannot wait to speak to you again. Looking forward to seeing you in person at some point when I get home. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. This was a Sassfin Wealth podcast. Visit sassfin.com forward slash wealth for more information.